So hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder and CEO here at Black Spectacles. I'm joined with our producer, Patrick Finnegan, and architect, Marissa Yeep, who's going to review several uh, programming and analysis mock exam questions. We're going to go through questions that cover PA knowledge and skills uh, related to assessing site feasibility for multifamily housing, exploring various massing configuration options for development, and understanding feasibility reports with site-specific details. So that's planned for the day. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, Black Spectacles is the leader in ARE prep. Uh, we work with learning scientists and architects to ensure you're studying the right contact, um, content and that you retain it so that you pass on the first try. Um, we've built everything that you need to pass the exams, including new video lectures with motion graphics and 3D animation, practice exams that are as close to the real thing as you can get, flashcards, quizzes, and virtual workshops, and they're all built upon a curriculum that ensures you're learning the right content and they all work together on our custom built platform to ensure that you retain the information so you remember it for the exams that's why our pass rates are 50 percent higher than the national average and why our members report passing in half the time the national average if you want to learn more you can visit blackspectacles.com and if you're ready to get studying now you can stick around to the end of today's episode and take advantage of our discount for individual memberships I should also mention um, just a few, oh, I don't know, maybe let's say a month, month and a half ago, uh, we launched a totally revamped uh, PA course. Um, so brand new video lectures, um, the whole bit um, is totally rebuilt. Um, and um, from my point of view, it's super impressive. I hope you'll uh, find the same. Our next uh, ARE live session will be on April 18th of 2024, where we'll be covering a PJM mock exam. Uh, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to sign up. And even if you're not sure if you can attend, I always recommend folks sign up because we'll definitely send you the uh, recording um, afterward, even if you're not able to attend. So you can just hop over there right now and register just so that you know you'll get the emails about it. As a reminder, we offer a referral program for firms and schools where if you introduce us to your boss or uh, HR, and if they sign up, we'll give you a $250 gift card. So to participate, follow the instructions over at our website uh, where you can uh, learn more at blackspectacles.com slash group dash referral. Um, the URL is on the screen, but that's the URL. And uh, yeah, encourage all of you to, um, you know, to share with your firm. We're going to be engaging exclusively on our online ARI community today. So head over to community.blackspectacles.com. And right at the top, you'll see we've pinned a thread for today's episode. If you have a question as we're going through ARE Live today, post your question there and we'll answer your question. You should also note that everyone who posts in that thread today will be eligible to win a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. Literally, all you have to do is go over to that post and say hi, and boom, you're registered. That's all you gotta do. Uh, of course, uh, you have to stay tuned till the end of the episode to find out if you won, but all you need to do is, is just say hello over there. So I'll be uh, tuning in um, you know, throughout the course of the session uh, today. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome today's guest, Marissa Yee. In addition to working uh, with us here at Black Spectacles, Marissa is an architect based in San Francisco. Welcome, Marissa. Thank you very much, Mark. Excited to be here with you all to discuss some PA topics. So today we'll be looking at specifically assessing site feasibility for multifamily housing, exploring various massing configuration options for development, understanding feasibility reports with site-specific details, identifying unique site considerations for the feasibility report, and comparing parking needs between residential and mall buildings. Love the image in the back of this, of this slide, by the way. All right, let's head into our first question. The architect has been hired to do a site feasibility study for a repeat client. The 40,000 square foot rectangular site is located near Lake Shoreline. It falls within the city's low development zone, thus having an FAR of 1.5 and a 10 foot setback on each side. The client wishes to develop the property into multifamily housing. Which of the following are possible massing configurations for a development on this site? Select the two that apply. Some possible answers are a one-story building, 40,000 square foot floor plate, one story with 60,000 square foot floor plate, two story building, 30,000 square feet floor plate, two stories with a 40,000 square foot floor plate, three stories with a 20,000 square foot floor plate, or a three story building with a 30,000 square foot floor plate. And our answers are C and E. 
we could potentially have a two-story building with a 30,000 square foot floor plate or a three-story building with a 20,000 square foot floor plate. So this question is asking us to look at possible massing configurations for the site. And we are given a variety of floor plate sizes with options for either a one-story, two-story, or three-story building. The question provides us a lot of information, but we actually don't need all of it. For example, the lake shoreline, the low development zone, and the multifamily housing are actually irrelevant information when it comes to calculating possible configurations from an FAR standpoint. So if I saw this on the exam, I would probably use the strike through tool so that I don't get distracted by all of that extra information and cross out info like lake shoreline, low development zone, and multifamily housing. So first off, let's find the maximum floor plate size that will fit on this site. Although we are not given a site map or overall dimensions of the site, we do know that in total, it is 40,000 square feet. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that we could have a 40,000 square foot floor plate exactly. This is because there is a 10 foot setback on each side of the site. So this means that our floor plate will actually need to be less than 40,000 square feet. This means we can eliminate answers A, B, and D because they all have a floor plate, suggested floor plate of 40,000 square feet or more. Now we can use the FAR to hone in on the correct answer. As a reminder, FAR stands for floor area ratio. It provides a ratio of total area that is allowed to be built on a site relative to the actual site of the lot. An FAR of 1.5 means the total area of our site can be up to 60,000 square feet, and it can be spread across multiple floors. So this would mean that F exceeds the allowable square footage. F, F is suggesting that we could have up to 90,000 square feet floor plate, but our FAR of 1.5 actually limits us to only 60,000 square feet. So we can eliminate F, and this brings us to C and E as our correct answers. As a quick reminder, when we are calculating the total allowable area, the FAR should be multiplied by the actual area of the site and not the area of the site minus setback. Any questions on number one? I don't think I have. We haven't, I don't think we have any questions right now. Um, awesome. Again, just a reminder to everybody, if you, uh, as we're going through this, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in our community, uh, community.blackspectacles.com. We've posted, we have a, uh, made a unique post for today's episode right at the top. So it should be easy to find. Just hop in. A bunch of people have already said hello um, and so forth, but no questions yet. All right. So, now we're gonna pretend that we're on the case study portion of the exam and we have a couple of exhibits to help us. First off, we have this zoning document, which includes a site map. And then if we head to the next slide, we're also given an exhibit from the IBC. We have table 504, which shows the allowable building heights. All right, so just keep these two resources in mind and we're gonna use them to help us through questions two through five. So here we have question number two. A developer has just secured a site in downtown Detroit. They have not yet decided how the property will be developed and have asked the architect to provide suggestions. Based on the exhibits, which of the following project types could be built on this site? Our answers are professional workplace, mixed use development, library, and single family residential. And our correct answer is B, mixed use development. So as I mentioned, these upcoming questions are intended to mimic what you might see during the case study portion of the exam. My personal recommendation when it comes to case studies is to first do a very, very brief skim of the resources provided so that you understand what you are referencing. So in my brief skim of this, what I'm seeing is that we have a zoning document, a site map, and the allowable heights table from 504.3 from the IBC. I would not recommend trying to read these resources in their entirety at the beginning of the case study and rather encourage you to look at the questions and use the questions to guide you to the various sections of the resources. In my opinion, I found the strategy to be most time efficient and least overwhelming. Um, here we only have two resources, but during the case study, sometimes they give you maybe six or seven resources and sometimes they are 
many, many, many pages long. And so it would be um, time prohibitive, prohibitive to try and read through all of that. So um, let's use the strategy of reading the questions and then having the question guide us to the information to look for within the resources. So the client is asking us for guidance on potential building types. For this, we should look to the zoning document. Under site information, we see that our zoning is listed as D2. So we're looking at that first blue arrow on the left, our zoning is D2. D2 is just a code for a type of zoning, which is described in more later in, in detail later in the document. If we continue on to the uses section, so now we're looking at the arrow on the right, we see that D2 includes multifamily residential, retail stores, restaurants, and cafes. A mixed use development could include all of the program types listed in D2, which would mix commercial with residential. This makes B the correct answer. Let's also touch briefly on the incorrect answers. Uh, we had C library. That would be a civic type of program, which is not listed under D2. D single family residential, that is also not listed under D2. So both library and single family residential are incorrect. And then we have professional workplace for answer A. That would be considered an office, which is listed under D1, but it's not listed under D2. So unfortunately, professional workplace is incorrect. Um, and this further suggests that B is the correct answer. Awesome, thank you, Marissa. Um, two things. Uh, number one, there is a question I'll get to in a second. There's a suggestion in the community, which is an interesting one. A couple of people are saying like, hey, could you, before you tell us what the answer is, could you walk us through kind of the, the logic of thinking through it um, and then tell us the answer, uh, which yeah, is totally uh, an that. interesting approach. So I love it. Uh, thanks to everyone who's, who's making that suggestion. And then the question uh, from the community uh, back on number one, uh, it says if the FAR is given as a ratio, like the FAR of five to one for a 40,000 square foot site, um, how is that calculated? For a 40,000 square foot site, if we had an FAR of five to one, I believe you would just multiply five by 40,000 square feet. And that means you could have up to 200,000 square feet of development on the site. Um, Got it. I may be second Perfect. guessing myself, but does that seem right to you, Mark? <laughs> that sounds right to me, yeah. yeah. Awesome, yeah, so thank you. Essentially saying your site is so many square feet, but the FAR is allowing you to increase or tell you how much more you can build on top of the actual area of the site. That's one way to think about it. Love it. And by All the way, that was a great tip earlier okay. about how to approach, um, you know, a giant pile of information like what we're looking at right here. Super smart to just, you know, to make sure you note to everyone, don't read the whole thing necessarily. Just go hunt for the information you need to answer yep. the question and move on. Yep. Hunt for the information. Exactly. Um, so for question three and on, we'll try to um, talk through the answers or talk through the thought process before giving the answers. This uh, Order of the slides is still gonna show you the correct answer, but I will try to um, make sure that I'm speaking to the thought process first. So question number three, after securing the site, the developer has provided the zoning ordinance and site information to the architect. The developer has asked the architect to provide a feasibility report and include information regarding unique considerations for the site. The developer intends to use this feasibility report to inform the project program, schedule, and budget. What unique considerations should the architect include in this report? Select the four that apply. Our possible answers are presence of chemical waste, increase in FAR if retail is provided along Keter Street, project must be lead silver equivalent, proximity to the coastline, majority office program not permissible, or must hold three public comment periods. All right, and if Patrick, you could, yep, thank you. Okay, so after reading this question, this comes off to me as something that is gonna require actually a lot of time and energy. The client is asking us to include unique considerations, I'm using air quotes here on a feasibility report, um, 
Unique considerations are not a strictly defined term and could be somewhat subjective. This is also something that will require us to skim through the zoning document rather than just being able to hone in on specific pieces of information like we did in the previous question. So now let's take a closer look at our zoning document. Under the additional information section, so we're looking towards those bottom three arrows there, we see that chemical waste, office program restriction, and public comment periods are all mentioned. So under chemical waste, it's saying the site has a history of chemical waste contamination. Developers must conduct an environmental assessment and remediation plan and present this to the planning department during the entitlements phase. So this is clearly stating that there is some sort of chemical waste on site. This means we can select A as one of the four correct answers. Okay, under office program restriction, it's saying no more than 50% of the building area may be allocated for office use. Okay, great. Um, that means that answer E, majority office program not permissible would be correct. And then F, must hold three public comment periods. This seems to align with the section under public comment periods. Before final permit approval, developers must hold no less than three public meetings to gather input from nearby residents and stakeholders. Findings from each comment period must be included in the permit issuance. Okay, so we've identified three of our four correct answers. Um, let's look at some of the other sections. So under development standards, we have FAR. It is saying that the maximum FAR for this lot is 1.5. However, if the development includes a minimum of 5,000 square feet of storefront retail adjacent to Peter Street, the FAR may be increased to 2.0. So this means that answer B is correct. Increase in FAR if retail is provided along Peter Street. So we have our four correct answers, A, B, E, and F. Um, let's talk through some of the other incorrect answers. So under the additional information section in the zoning document, sustainability is mentioned. Um, in the very bottom there, it says all parties are encouraged to incorporate sustainability elements into their development. However, Lead silver is not specifically mentioned, so unfortunately, we cannot pick C. And then if we look at the development standard section, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. The other answer that was incorrect was proximity to the coastline. Um, to double check this, we would look at our map. I'm not seeing a coastline anywhere near that map. Um, even though downtown Detroit does have a little bit of a river coastline. So we would not be able to pick answer D, which says proximity to the coastline. Okay, now that we've gone through the question, just wanna go over a couple of uh, testing strategies. Um, at the beginning of this question, I mentioned that this was gonna take a little bit longer. And as you can see, it took so long because we we really did have to do a deeper dive into this zoning document to help pick out what would be unique considerations. If you happen to be running out of time in the exam, in my opinion, this would be a good question to just choose some answers that sound good and move on. It's also uh, helpful to eliminate the two answers that are incorrect rather than trying to select the four answers that are correct. Um, so if we go to our answer slide, for example, it's unlikely that the exam would mention lead silver by name and more likely that it would include uh, general language like sustainability requirements or energy requirements. So um, that would be a signal to me that C is possibly incorrect. Um, and then D jumps out to me as definitely incorrect based on a quick glance at the site map and seeing that there is no coastline. So if I were in a rush, I would eliminate C and D, which would lead me to selecting A, B, E, and F. Doing good. I don't think we have any specific questions on this one, Marissa, so you can rock and roll, I think. Awesome. Okay, let's head to question four. The developer is concerned about the ability to develop a parking garage with adequate stall counts and parking flow. 
They are interested in providing only the minimum required number of spaces and are deciding between a residential building with 40 units or a mall building. How many more parking spaces will need to be provided for the mall building rather than the residential building? Assume a building area of 40,000 square feet. Our potential answers are 134 parking spaces, 80 parking spaces, 54 parking spaces, or 50 parking spaces. All right, so let's go through the thought process first. This is a tricky question. Not only is the client asking you to look at parking requirements, they still have not decided whether to move forward with a residential building or a mall building. So what we're really gonna have to do is run two parallel scenarios and then compare them at the end. So let's go back to our zoning document. Under development standards and then parking requirements, we see that a residential building requires a minimum of two parking spaces per unit. A mall building would be considered commercial and requires one stall for every 300 square feet of development. We don't need the parking requirements for an office building for this particular question, so we'll just leave that information behind. Okay, let's go to our next page where we show some calculation steps. There we go. Okay. So we already did step one, find the parking space requirements in the zoning document. We found that residential requires two spaces per dwelling unit. Mall buildings require one parking space for 300 square feet of retail space. Now we need to find out how many parking spaces are required for each type of building. So for residential in the question, we are given that there are 40 dwelling units that will be included in the building. We need two parking spaces per unit, so we'll do 40 dwelling units multiplied by two parking spaces. This means our residential building would need 80 parking spaces. For our mall building, uh, we are given in the question that it is 40,000 square feet. We would divide this by 300 square feet uh, per one parking space. This means that we would have a total of 134 parking spaces required if we were to build a mall building. Okay, we just did a lot of math, but we're not quite done yet. The question is not asking us how many parking spaces in a residential building or how many parking spaces in a mall building. The question specifically asks how many more parking spaces are required for the mall building. So what we'll need to do is take the number of parking spaces in the mall building and subtract the number of parking spaces in the residential building. So we're doing 134 minus 80, this is gonna give us 54 additional parking spaces required for the mall building. So if we go to our answer slide, we see that our correct answer is C, 54 parking spaces. And the exam will always give you um, wrong answers that seem right. Because aside from D, uh, a, which says 134 parking spaces, and B, which says 80 parking spaces, are numbers that we had to use to get to our final answer. So it would, it could be easy on the exam to calculate for 134 parking spaces or the 80 parking spaces and think that you are done with the question, but in reality, perhaps there was one final step that you needed to do to get the correct answer. So. But as a reminder for all of us to just make sure we're reading the questions carefully and answering the actual question that they are asking. All right, let's head to our last question of the day. The developer is considering using the site for a multifamily residential building of type 3A construction. The building will include laundry facilities, a gym, a lobby with a front desk and a small coffee shop. The coffee shop will be accessible to the public from Peter Street. What is the maximum height of this building? Our potential answers are 65 feet, 75 feet, 85 feet, or 90 feet. All right, so there are a few locations we'll need to look at to determine the maximum height of the building. And let us all remember the golden rule, which is that when two codes or two pieces of information conflict, the more restrictive will apply. So first we're gonna look at our zoning document. Under site information, 
the maximum height of the building is listed as 75 feet. However, the zoning document gives us a hint, which says C, increase opportunities. So let's head to the development standards section under allowable height. It again states, um, go back to the zoning document, please. Okay, under allowable height, it says, again, that 75 feet is the maximum, but there is a note about penthouses being able to exceed this height up to a total of 90 feet. But if we keep reading, it says these non-occupied mechanical penthouses shall not be considered part of the overall building height. So this would make D 90 feet incorrect. And so far, per the zoning document, the maximum height of our building is still 75 feet. All right, the question also provides us with construction type 3A, so we should also look at the height of the building per the allowable height table, IBC 504.3. We are a residential building of type 3A construction, which gives us 65 feet unsprinklered and 85 feet sprinklered. So to read through this table a little more closely, in that first column, we have occupancy classification. We are R for residential. So we're looking at this bottom row that has R. If we look at the subscript H just next to the R, it's super tiny. But it, what it says is that new group R occupancies are required to be protected by an automatic sprinkler system, uh, blah, blah, blah. So what this is telling us is that because we are a new residential construction, our building will need to be sprinklered. That is how we determine whether to use the bot very bottom row, which is sprinklered, or the second to bottom row, which is non-sprinklered. So then we take our construction type, which is 3A, which is the arrow pointing down, and go all the way down until it matches with residential and sprinklered. This will give us 85 feet of allowable building height per this table. But we are not done. Now we're given two conflicting pieces of information because previously, per our zoning document, we determined that 75 feet is the maximum allowable height. But this table, from the IBC here is telling us that we could have up to 85 feet of allowable height for our building. Now is when we need to apply the golden rule. The more restrictive piece of information will apply. This makes 75 feet our answer and B, answer B is correct. So it is not 65 feet. That would have been a misreading of the allowable Heights table if you had used a non sprinklered building. It is not 85 feet. This is a reading of the allowable heights table for the sprinklered building, and it is not 90 feet because the zoning document stated that penthouses do not count towards the allowable height of the building. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> we got one question, but I think you answered it um, by. Sh by sort of showing the conclusion. The question was, the is the table at the end of, um, provided, uh, is the table at the end of the resource regarding allowable height just a distractor? I think you just showed that it was not a distractor. It was, it was necessary to solve the problem. Did I follow that right? Yes, you should still check both. It, it, what ended up happening at the very conclusion is that the zoning document prevailed. So one might consider the IBC table to be a distraction, but on the exam, you should, if time allows, and hopefully it does, uh, what the correct way to solve this is to check both and then compare the two. Love it. Awesome. Well, that's all for today. Thank you so much, Marissa. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much for helping support, uh, you know, the architecture community. Of course. Thank you. Um, just a reminder to everybody that our next ARE Live will be on April 18th of 2024. We'll be covering the PJM mock exam, and you can register for that uh, right away um, at blackspectacles.com slash podcast, or check out the community page for this episode. Um, it's funny, um, I just recently realized um, Patrick and I have been posting 
uh, mock exam question on our social channels, and we haven't let you guys know about that. So um, if you want to get questions like this, you know, throughout the course of your, let's say, social media time, um, whether on Instagram, TikTok, or Facebook, um, we've been posting questions over there and would encourage you to do so. Um, maybe it'll make you feel better about <laughs> uh, spending time on social media. Um, so if you don't already follow us, certainly suggest that you do. On Instagram and TikTok, we're, um, our handle is at black.spectacles. And then on Facebook, we're just Black Spectacles. So uh, you can find us there and then you'll you'll get kind of automatically, you'll get our um, our posts there um, and, you know, throughout the course of the, the month in between episodes. It's, 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 a, it's a lovely thing that uh, Patrick's been doing. So um, as a reminder, we offer a referral program for firms and schools where if you introduce us to your boss or to the HR folks, uh, and if they sign up, we'll give you a $250 gift card as a way of saying thanks. So to participate, follow the instructions on blackspectacles.com slash group dash referral. Congratulations to Lucretia.Jones. Uh, you posted on our Airy community today and you just won a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. Um, so congrats and thanks to you and thanks to everybody else who has posted on our community today. Uh, Lucretia.Jones will reach out via email to get your size and shipping information. So we'll be in touch. Just a reminder, um, if you'd like to be eligible to win a t-shirt, post a question uh, that you might have about our featured topic or just say hello uh, during the next ARE Live. And you know, our community is always active. It's not just for ARE Live. Um, so poke around and see what your peers are up to and asking about. And if you ever have a, a question, especially technical question as you're studying, feel free to drop it in there. Uh, we have licensed architects who are paying attention to uh, the questions that are in there and, and answer them straight away. So uh, encourage you to uh, use that. If you're joining us for the first time, Black Spectacles is the leader in, in architecture test prep. Uh, we work with learning scientists and architects to ensure you're studying the right content and that you retain it so that you pass on the first try. And as a thank you for attending today, we'd like to offer you a 15% discount um, off of any membership uh, with the code PALIVE15, which is valid until April 17th of 2024. Finally, please be sure to stick around for a few minutes to take our survey and share any suggestions you may have. I promise we read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. Thanks for tuning in.